Hello and welcome to the Final Girls podcast. I'm Anna, co-founder of the Final Girls and your podcast host. We might be in a hiatus right now, but we're still very active over on our Patreon page and still watching a ton of horror movies and TV shows. And in today's bonus episode, I got to sit down for a good chunk of time with writer Naomi Alderman and showrunner Rael Tucker. And in today's episode, I was lucky enough to sit down for a good chunk of time with some of the minds behind Amazon's new original series, The Power, which is based by the absolutely sensational novel of the same name by Naomi Alderman. And I actually got to sit down with the author herself, as well as the series showrunner, Rael Tucker, who has worked on some of my favorite shows like True Blood or Jessica Jones. And now that the series finale for The Power is about to air on Prime Video, it's time to share my interview with Naomi and Rael. And if you haven't enjoyed the show yet, it's an absolute banger. I binged watched it uh, as many episodes as they shared with me initially in a single day and they could not wait to see the finale and friend of the pod and writer Isaura Barbara Brown and myself go deep into the show over on the Patreon page so you'll be able to listen that tomorrow as soon as the final episode drops. In the meantime, this interview is entirely spoiler free and so you can listen to our deep dive on the power finale and everything over on the Final Girls Patreon. And with all of that said, please enjoy my conversation with Naomi Alderman and Rael Tucker. Naomi, Rael, thank you so much for joining me. It's such a pleasure to meet the both of you to talk about the power. Well, thank you. So excited to be here. It's a joy to be here. Thank you. So, um, Naomi, I want to start with you and I wanted to ask you a little bit about the years long journey now to bring the power onto the screen. Can you tell me a little bit how that's been? Right. Well, you know, nobody expected the global pandemic in the middle. <laughs> so that was, that was all quite an excitement. But yeah, no, we, we've had an amazing journey, actually. So uh, I finished the book in 20, end of, tw- end of 2015. It was published in 2016. And um at that point, before it was published, there was, I think, a 12-way bidding war for the rights to the option, which eventually went to Sister Pictures, who have, you know, got the show made through the global pandemic, which was never a given. And um, then we had, I uh, uh, worked on the show for a while, like, writing the pilot and figuring out this, the show. And we sold after, there was a, we had another bidding war between different uh TV networks, uh, streaming video networks. Um, in 2018, uh, I had I had an amazing meeting with Jen Salke, who's the head of Amazon Studios, who um, I talked about what the book meant and what I want the sh- wanted the show to mean, and uh, we both we were both crying by the end of that meeting because I think we just all felt so passionately about it. And then uh, 2019, working with an amazing group of writers. Uh, making like like writing the show and then obviously we were we started filming in february 2020 and then things happened and here we are now in 2023 so um i think you know just it, it has actually been very um moving and wonderful that uh Amazon have had such a commitment to the show that so many people working have had such a commitment to it somebody who worked on it said Honestly, Naomi, if this had been just a, you know, fun murder mystery, it would have fallen by the wayside because just to have got to that point when you're ready to film the whole thing and then you have to shut down, you know, people's careers move on, like the sets that have been put up have to be taken down, but everyone has been so committed to it. And I mean, Rael, I must pay tribute to the work that you have done on this show. My God. So Rael is a showrunner who has managed to make this um, horrifically ambitious and multi-stranded story make sense across 
multiple characters, uh, different diverse experiences around the world. And you have somehow pulled it together so that the story that I wanted it to be is there on the screen. That's the nicest thing you ever could have said. I, I can you. say even nicer things than that to you. <laughs> keep, I, keep, keep talking. <laughs> I I will just uh, yeah I I just I I think the work that I've seen right Raya's a genius and has just held the heart of the show so completely that like every scene is reflects what I really wanted it to be which is you know that's your skill not my skill like you you've, you've done it that's a beautiful segue into Raya talking about your relationship with Naomi's book and also for you, I'm always curious with, you know, with um, with screenwriters, with showrunners, with filmmakers, what was your entry point into adapting, into making the power into a piece of screen work? Well, the first thing I have to say, and this is going to be a good segue into my answer to that, is that, you know, bless you, Naomi Alderman. Like, <laughs> I, I could not adore or admire you more. I'm afraid this is the truth, is that we do love each other. <laughs> <laughs> and it would be more, I expect, dramatic for podcast listeners if we were to have a flaming row. But in fact, we do actually love each other. So I feel like maybe I should just like leave the room. Yeah, that yeah, and and just keep yeah. the recorder here. Uh, <laughs> and I'll just exit. So I, I read Naomi's incredible book right when it came out in 2016, and I was halfway through the novel, and I called up my agent kind of angrily, actually, and I said. <laughs> Tell me this is not in development because if it is, why am I not the showrunner? This is exactly what I want to do. Why does this not land on my desk? Why can I not have this job? And she was like, yeah, rights have been gone since before it was published. And, you know, the author's doing it. And yeah, no, it's it's ship has sailed, right? I'll let it up. And the thing about it wasn't just arbitrary. I had come off some really big shows and I was asking this question kind of jokingly, but I was like, where is my Game of Thrones? Mm. I wanted to do something female-driven mm. that was massive, that was big, and I felt as a showrunner that I was ready for something mm -hmm. like that. But those shows don't come around very often. There aren't a lot of them. They cost a lot of money. They mm -hmm. take a long time. And typically, there is a whole line of people wanting to run those shows. So... Um, I was sort of frustrated that one had not fallen into my lap at this point. Um, and the power was already, you know, in development. So I just had to forget all about it and moved on and did lots of stuff that I'm very proud of. But I got a call from Amazon years later and they said, hey, would you want to come in and work on a show that was shot during the pandemic? And I'm just like rolling my eyes at them. Like, no chance am I going in to work on some show that's already started. And then they said, it's The Power by Naomi Alderman. And I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> there goes all of my plans for the next years of my life out the window. Um, it really was that immediate. As soon as I knew what it was, there was no question that I felt it was destiny. I felt like I was meant to do it. Um, and I was terrified because it's very difficult. It's all these interweaving storylines they aren't always so clearly connected. They don't intersect immediately, especially on the show adaptation. And I was really, really afraid because brilliant artists had come and worked on the show already. And I was going to have to come in and mess with their work. Mm. And this you is mean my make it better. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is this is my segue back to you in a sec, because early on, it, I think it was probably the second time we ever spoke. I was expressing this to Naomi, how scared I was and how much respect I had for her and the writing and all the other people who had worked on the show. And Naomi said, Rael, whatever you do, don't respect me so much that you're afraid to make this fucking great. Do whatever you need to do to make this fucking great. Don't respect anyone too much. And it set me free. It allowed me to go and do the work. I could not have done it otherwise. I was so afraid to mess it up that I would have second-guessed myself out of this job. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, you know, one thing that I learned during this process is you've got to rely on the other brilliant people around you, you know. And um, I think, I think obviously, once you're, once you're making a show in a pandemic, you have, you have some challenges. I, I actually, I've learned a very interesting thing that is related mm -hmm. to electricity, 
that I can tell you. This is real. I got it from the uh, science advisor on the show. Mm -hmm. So even though it's going to sound a bit woo-woo, it is actually real, which is when people are in a room together and they're, when we're working together, uh, for example, when you have an orchestra who are playing together, making mm -hmm. work together, you can actually like watch, if you're doing brain scans, you can watch people's brain waves um, line up. So like their brains are, are producing electric waves in the, in the same uh, rhythm. Not playing the same notes, but and of course during the pandemic, there's what we could not do was be in a room together, mm -hmm. and I think, you know, that's incredibly challenging. You want everybody really wants to get the brain waves lined up, and wants to get everything moving in sync, and yet actually it's incredibly tough. And at that point, you need, you know, I, I'm a novelist, but you need somebody who's a TV expert to be able to kind of come in and make that happen so we are very lucky you know that we got you royale you're brilliant you're so, brilliant no no you, sorry you. We, we're just gonna do this the whole time <laughs> that's gonna be that's gonna be your podcast and I, I wanted to ask you both really um a lot of things that happened specifically have happened to women and bodily autonomy and women's rights since the novel's publication. How has the new reality, the new context for women's lives has informed this adaptation? Right. Well, okay. So um, I think there are certain things that um, in advance I could see were coming. So for example, we have the character of Urban Docs, mm -hmm. who is um, an internet troll. So look, I was working uh, as a woman in video games in the in 2014 during Gamergate, if people remember that. And uh, that was targeted harassment of women in games. And at that point, I put the character of Urban Docs into the book because I was like, this feels like something. And now, of course, I don't even want to say any of the names of the men that we reference in the show, but certainly people who know the world will see that that what, what Rael has done there is to bring that really up to date. And there are, you know, men in the world who are saying absolutely appalling things about women and ga garnering huge followings, particularly amongst young men and boys. And uh, the secret, I think we talked about this, the secret is uh, with, with this that um, when you listen to the news and something makes you feel angry and upset with this you can just put it straight into the work because you're going to flip it over it's not going to be just uh you know repeating the same thing you go okay we can come at this from a completely different angle it's very cathartic so yeah that is good i mean look obviously I would rather that in the past three years it had all become irrelevant because everything had been solved in terms of gender dynamics in the world, but it hasn't been. So we might as well do a fun, explosive, adrenaline-filled, exciting show that also at the end makes you go, huh, huh, I'm, I feel, I'm thinking a lot of new thoughts right now. Yeah, and right while I was working on some of the reshoot writing, what happened with Roe v. Wade in the United States, right. right? And it lit a fire under all of our asses. You know, we felt at that point that if there was ever a doubt that the show was relevant or necessary, that it just became urgent at that moment right? Um, in a bigger way for all mm -hmm. of us. And and kind of on that note, on the flip side of that, there's a lot of things that have also changed in film and TV culture. One of the biggest genres that's exploded over well the last 20 years has been superhero films. Mm. And this is in a way a superhero adaptation. Rael, can you talk a little bit about how that particular genre um, informed some of the visualization, especially of the power and the pacing of the um, of the show? I definitely have worked on some very big genre shows. You know, I worked on True Blood uh, for many years and I worked on Jessica Jones. And so, I, you know, this is not my first rodeo when it comes to a zillion VFX shots and uh, living in a world of wish fulfillment and fantasy. <laughs> um, so that stuff is comfortable territory for me. The thing about it is I'm pretty much inspired by human beings, though, and human behavior, and that's kind of where all the storytelling comes from. I don't spend a lot of time thinking, per se, about, oh, let's explain the power. What does the power do? I feel like when you do it right, all of those things fall into place behind the character development, that it's all coming from an emotional place, and it's grounded in something that 
an audience can actually identify with and relate to and see themselves in. And so, um, yes, there's a lot of, you know, technical shit that you have to get into, you know, are, what do the sparks look like? Are they too yellow? Are they too thick? Are they too thin? I mean, hours and hours and hours of people st- sitting around in Zoom calls for hours discussing, like, you know, the width of an electrical burst and a skein and what it should look like and what sound should it make and is somebody else's bigger than somebody else's and all that stuff happens. But to me, that's kind of like, that's kind of like the sparkles are, you know, that you put on top of the cupcake. It's not the cupcake, right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, it's not, it's not what really matters to me. It is, it is really, I mean, I'm just about to praise my own show, but there you go. Like, you know, I'm a fan of X Men. I'm a mm-hmm. I was I'm, I'm a huge fan of both True Blood and Jessica Jones. I think what's what sort of I haven't I don't think I've ever seen before is that thing where everybody's developing the same power. So when you explain it for one character, then you've got it for all the characters. Mm-hmm. But also, instead of you know, there's there's that thing where in X Men everybody's got a different power. And then you kind of go, okay, well, like, like each person is somehow, like the power somehow represents them. You know, this guy does ice and he's also quite, co- like whatever it is. And with this, you go, okay, no, exactly what you're talking about, where you go, yeah, this is the same thing being refracted through different characters, one after another, after another. And then you get to that question of, okay, so is this changing people or is it revealing who they always were? You know, what is happening when, when you, in, a, in, in, you know, so we've, we've got like, the show has, uh, I mean, this, this is, this is my ridiculousness, which I just wanted to do as many genres as I could in the book. So we've got like a gangster story and a political thriller and a, um, like a Southern Gothic story and an investigative journalism and story. a cult and a mm-hmm. cult, just, just throwing it in there um, and and uh, yeah not to mention a couple of things that are like hinted at in the book but are massive in the in the tv now um and i think that that's the sort of excitement is to go i mean i must say i think rael has you've done yourself down there because one of the things that you do really well um is is that just very technical thing of going i'm going to explain in 30 seconds how this works Mm-hmm. You know, they, and it, and you go immediately. So there's a moment. Um, yeah, I think I can say this. There's a moment fairly early on where Ali, who's a character mm-hmm. um, who who uh, has been abused, and and in the first episode we see her escape that abuse. There's a moment early on where uh, she there's there's a, the the girls in the convent where she's living find a pigeon, and the pigeon is dead, and she picks it up and we see her using her power to make its heart beat again and this this was something that you brought into and you just the moment that you see it and you have a a very short shot of her going inside and setting the pigeon's heart beating again oh okay that's what she can do that is so different to everybody else and it's masterful It's, it's it's an extra 30 seconds if that in the show and yet you feel like you've understood so much so that is a real skill and you only underrate it because you're so good at it that's very kind of you. I think the thing to me that I love about television and what, everything that we do, you talk about pacing. For me, it's, you know, I want to feel like I'm on board a train mm. that's just going yeah. and I, mm. I don't me ever want to get off and I don't know where we're going. If, and, and, and I just, I don't ever want it to end, but I, 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 I'm on board for the journey. And I think that is something that genre shows typically tend to do really well and I do think part of the secret is what Naomi said is that for me when you get caught up in the exposition of having to explain Mm. all of that stuff to try to make somebody believe in it you're off the train the train is stalled Mm. you know and so you just kind of you kind of have to find a way to be really economical and like make sure it's not slowing you down and it's not getting it's not hanging you up I definitely felt that with the show even though I've read the book and I knew where the story was going I was still thrilled in the same way because I couldn't I couldn't see you know with the subtle changes like what if what if this is different Mm -hmm. what if this means something else and I wanted to ask you both you know it's a great point that this the power that they all get is the same so we only need one or two moments of explanation but the way that each character reacts to being Mm -hmm. gifted this power is radically different so I was wondering how do you think each character um 
uh, in the show allows us to explore the different manifestations of power you know be that religious uh political gender power physical or any you know digital power as well through um through the kind of uh, the andrew tate type uh digital influencer so can you talk a little bit about that yeah so something that you know when 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 you're writing a book, you know if it's working if you're finding out things that you didn't know before you started. And I'm never, I've am never i never been interested in writing a book where I felt like I knew all the answers to start off with. So something that became clear to me during the writing of the book is that power is fungible, which is to say, you know, one form can be transformed into another form. So you can turn uh, financial power into political power. You can turn political power into uh, military power. You can turn military power back again into money, you know, and you can turn religious power into, into uh, you know, all these other kinds of power. So, um, yeah, we, I, I picked characters who could speak to some of those things. And I think that, um, when when you when you see them in the show it's it's sort of thrilling to see those journeys of each character where you go okay every character in there i'm like staring at the poster here with all the faces on it <laughs> every character in there is exploring like flexing her muscles going what can i do and the answers are very different for b- because of the positions they're in to start off with so Margot, the character who's played, I mean, oh my God, Tony Collette is so good. She's so good. Oh God, every time she's on screen, you just cannot take your eyes off her. Um, So she she starts out in a position. Well, already you would say, oh, she's quite powerful. You know, she's she's like a mayor of a major American city. Like she's got a lot of power. And then you start to go, oh, okay. So first of all, you have brilliant stuff in there, Royale, about the, the limits to her power. And you also have the sense that she's somebody who's just frustrated. She's like topped out. You know, she's come to as far as you can possibly think she's going to go. And then you go, okay, so what happens when you give that person a bit of like, like you take the glass ceiling off Mm -hmm. and like, how far is she going to go? I think that's completely thrilling. Um, But then I think, I think we're talking about different complicated motivations um a new character in the show is uh ndudi who is um friend of tunde ojas the the journalist and uh, who's played by tohib jimo and and Dudi is played by heather agipon she's fantastic um i i said to her the other day that i think her character is the most sane in the whole show which is you know that 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 was a new voice that i think we needed actually is somebody going come on now we've got to use this for everybody's benefit and we've got to somehow figure out how to live with this in a sensible way and like whether or not good sense is going to prevail i mean readers of the book will know how the book ends but i should say that i i don't don't believe in fate i think that there's more than one way for this story to go if we get another some some other seasons i think we can explore how it could go in quite a lot of different directions. Who knows? That's part of the fun of television. We keep you guessing. <laughs> <laughs> and Ryle, uh, Naomi, you kind of hinted at this, but one of the most compelling parts of the show, what I've seen so far, is Tony Collette's character, Marco, but especially the her relationship with her husband, played mm. by Joan Leguizamo, and this the dynamic between the private and the public self of her as a woman in, in political power, as the mother of a young teenager who gets it, her dynamic with her uh, with her partner as well. Can you talk a little bit about building that in the show and also what did um, Tony Collette and Joan Leguizamo bring to those characters? Well, that was the huge gift, right? You never know what's going to happen when you randomly throw two human beings into a marriage and say, hey, you know, act like it's been happening for 20 years. Um, They had incredible chemistry, I think, from Mm -hmm. the first moment that they were on screen together. They laughed behind the scenes all day. They also just got deep really fast. I believed in this relationship. And it's not one that I've seen very much on television, right? Like, this is an accomplished man, a confident, um, you know, aspirational husband. But he is, he is so confident that he is sort of giving the space for his wife to shine and be the superstar of that relationship. While he does a lot of the more, you know, what we've historically seen as traditional female roles. Um, 
I think that was one of the things that really appealed to John Leguizamo in the role. Like he wanted to tell that story to, to inhabit that because it's not what you so often see. And so often we shame women who are ambitious. Uh, I really identify with that as a woman who is very ambitious mm -hmm. and who wants power over my own creativity and my work was really important for us in the storytelling to not shame Margot's character for being busy, for having a life. It wasn't about, you know, her coming home and being like, oh, you've abandoned us. You know, Joss's anger at her mother comes from a very specific place that isn't about abandonment. It's mm -hmm. about having to be under the public eye, you know? Um, and it also feels really normal teenage anger. Yeah. Like mm. anybody who has a child of roughly that age yeah. knows that feeling where they turn around and go, everything that you do is stupid and mm. I hate you. And that's just, that's a normal part of, and if anybody who was a teenager will look back and go, oh yeah, I did do that at some point. So yeah. And can you imagine also being, you know, 16, 17 years old and having people scrutinize mm. you on a global stage? Like, I think that's something that I haven't, luckily didn't have to experience, but it's really understandable how that went piss somebody off who kind of wants to disappear at that time of their life. Um, but yes, the marriage between uh, those two characters, I think, is one of the foundations of the show. I think it's not only relatable, accessible to a lot of people who can see their own dynamics reflected there, but it's also such an interesting way to talk about what the, what this power does to a family and to see that ripple effect through each of the characters in this family very differently. And it, it kind of brings me to another question where... One of the things that I really loved about the book and really loved uh, about the show is that it does not do that thing of because it's a show centered on women, the men are reduced to caricatures, mm -hmm. that they're not participating in the shift that this the superpower has provoked in everyone. Um, can you talk a little bit about working the the male characters into the show and especially them, you know, when thinking of Ryan, thinking of Tunde, of, of thinking of Rob as well, and how you work with the actors so essentially creating that you know absolute shift in power dynamics and gender dynamics of even feeling physically unsafe around female characters which is not really something we well nothing not really something we experience in reality and definitely something that's still rare on the screen yeah i mean naomi started it with developing tunde in the book who is an incredibly complex and multi-dimensional male character which i thought was very very clever to include that as one of the the main characters on the show it was important to expand beyond that obviously um and we just you know it's an embarrassment of riches john leguizamo is a fucking legend that man yeah. you know he's so talented that when i came in one of when i was i came in to do some reshoots we expanded his character massively in the reshoots we developed way more scenes with him because it was just an opportunity. You know, he's such a fine actor and also wanted to understand how a father might experience this power happening to his daughter, but not only that, his son. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite scenes that we got to shoot and um, this summer in Vancouver was a scene with uh, Rob's uh, son, Maddie. And it's a classic scene that we've all either lived through or seen before where you know it's typically a little girl saying boys at school are mean to me and they pick on me and then the parent says they do that because they like you mm -hmm. and everyone goes ah this was a moment where that was totally reversed but it was horrific to maddie who's saying girls at school are violent and dad's going well maybe they just like you and and just by turning the genders of that it i think it hopefully will make some people who've never had to think about that actually think about it differently. What that experience may be for somebody who's receiving that kind of treatment um, and sort of being told that that's cute. Right. So um, my, my mom is, a, is an art teacher. And uh, when I when I was growing up, I always used to, you know she took I used to be in her lessons. One of the exercises that she would always get her students to do is to copy um, a famous painting, but copy it upside down. So you know you turn the Van Gogh sunflowers or Mona Lisa upside down, then you copy it. And the thing is, when you're so used to looking at something, it's very difficult to really see what's there. Mm. 
And then the moment you turn it upside down, you've defamiliarized it and you can just see it. You properly see it. And I think that's one of those moments in the show. It's a wonderful moment where, where um, you hear what Rob, John Leguizamo's character, is saying and you go, what do you mean? Like, we've seen these women, you know, we've seen women do terrifying things. Why are you telling him to experience this as a kind of affection? And then you turn it back over the other way around and go, oh, the world. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, you know, I think, like, I am not somebody who has the answers to all of these questions. I have some thoughts, but, but what I can do is show the world as it is and to say, come on, let's look at this again. Let's have an exciting journey together. Let's follow these amazing characters. And at the end of that, let's go, and how do we feel about the world right now? How do we feel about the world that we live in? Do we, are we pleased with that? Are we, are we feeling like this is, is they okay? Or maybe not? <laughs> that's, that's, that's what we're up to. And just as a final question for the both of you, what would you like people to take away from the power when they watch the show? Oh, my God. Oh, that's such a difficult one because this is a massive global show with so many themes that we're tackling all at once. I think there's so many. I mean, one of them is just fucking talk to each other is, I think, a big one. Um, I think it's not about division. I think that anything that we're doing to create more division between, you know, the sexes, between groups of people is 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 leading towards a world that none of us want. Um, power is scary and nobody should have absolute power. Well, yeah. Um, I mean, I think some of it is in the name of the show, yeah. <laughs> which, which, which is to say uh, all of these characters, you know, and they're, and, they're, and it's, it's, it's a really diverse set of stories. All of them, all of our main characters get more power as the show goes on. And that's really the question the show is asking, I think. How do people get power? How does it affect you? Are we happy with the way that this that, that that power is handed out in the world? Can we understand how it accumulates? It's not just about gender. It is about gender, but it's also about all of those different elements. You know, it's also about race. It's also about poverty. It's, but, but it's also just about the nature of power itself. Um, I had a line in the book, which is something like power seeks itself, seeks to accumulate. And I think you see that happening through the show. And then you can go, okay, I feel like maybe I've understood something. And then once you've understood that, maybe we can then talk about checks and balances and things that we might like to do differently. But the first thing is, you know, I think I think what Rael has created here is a rip-roaring ride where you don't know what any of these characters are going to do. And then the end, you come out the end going, huh, so that's how the world works. Hmm. Well, maybe we can talk about how to make it a bit different. Thank you both so much for your time, for sharing your insight and also for making the show. I had I had an incredible time with it and I'm just annoyed that I couldn't see the end of it yet. Oh my God, the end's so good. I'm really sorry. <laughs> Thank you for having me. That last episode is fantastic. Aww. Yeah, sorry. Thank you so much for having us. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs>